have any focus on it. So I really don't learn anything if I don't like what I'm doing. So I went through many years of um, school, not really comprehending uh, much of what was being taught there because I wasn't interested. In it. The only thing I really could do is, is art. So, um, you know, I, I uh, ended up in art school. Um, see, like when I was young, uh, you know, I was uh, labeled by my friends as kind of being weird because I would do things like uh, one time my friend was getting ready and there was a, um, a plate of butter left on the kitchen table and it was cold out, it was winter time, so the butter was pretty hard. So I sculpted it into a dog. And, you know, my um, friend's family didn't really appreciate it. <laughs> they didn't have uh, much appreciation for the arts. So that's how I was kind of labeled weird. I would do things that were kind of out of the ordinary. And um, then in my, you know, in my teen years, my father um, died, you know, um, suddenly, you know, we weren't expecting it unexpectedly. So, you know, those were kind of um, years in my life that became, you know, I wasn't really stressed because I didn't know stress then, but I think I was really stressed because I had a lot of um, reactions that said I was under stress. But I had a good community because many of my neighbors would, um, would hire me to paint pictures so that would give me extra spending money. And I had a really good friend whose parents realized that I had a lot of talent. So they would have us paint, um, you know, stay home and paint pictures. They bought us canvases and paint and all that stuff. So uh, that's what pretty much, you know, kept me going in the art field because people noticed my talent. And then in high school, I didn't really, uh, you know, do well because I wasn't focused. So I get thrown out of one high school and luckily I had a really good guidance counselor because he um, recommended that I go to the new high school that was just being built, Tollgate High School, and they had a vocational re, not, not a rehab, a vocational um, part of the school where you could, um, I was in commercial arts and so I was in art class probably most of the day, I only, the only classes I had to take was English and gym besides art. So that really honed in on my um, art career. You know, I learned a lot of commercial art. And then from there, one of my friends was going to, uh, you know, she was applying for college. And so I said, I really wanted to go with her, you know? So I applied and, and I was accepted. And then I went to Swain School of Design. So once I was in Swain School of Design, I finally found, you know, the people that I could relate to. Um, I sort of was on the same frequency. So we understood each other. And, you know, that was really good for me to have that. But then I realized after about three years that everything I was being taught was of European um, background. So, you know, they would teach how, you know, Van Gogh painted or Renoir or Rembrandt and all these um, artists that I really couldn't relate to. Um, you know, I could relate to them in, at a, on an aesthetic uh, kind of sort of way, but not through, you know, what I was feeling and what I experienced. So uh, at one point I just said to my professors, you know, I don't want to learn any more about the European art or the European painters. I want to learn more about the native people from my homeland here in the Northeast. And there was nothing that they could really do because there wasn't, there wasn't a, um, a professor available that knew that kind of work. So that's where I, I um, started painting. That's such a perfect transition to the next question, Deb. Because well, okay. the, no, if, if I interrupted, go ahead and continue and then I'll ask it. I just want to show you the um, painting, the first painting that I did that wasn't um, of European. The last painting that I did that when I was in Swain School of Design, when I said, this is the last painting I'm going to do for, um, you know, 
with European background. So yeah. can I uh, Please share your screen? So just go play. First, you have to share your screen. Uh oh, backwards. Okay. Hit, uh, um, at the bottom, it's green. It says share screen. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. Get to that place. Play. You're still not sharing your screen. Share your screen. Oh, over there. The at the bottom. Okay. okay. I um. Uh oh. Don't mind me saying uh oh so much. My granddaughter was here yesterday, and that's all she says is uh oh. <laughs> okay. There we go. It's starting to share, so that's perfect. All right. I forgot that little blue button. Now I'm going to play. Now you're going to play. So let's scroll down. Uh, this is the last painting. Can you see it? Yes. I, I have people in front of it, but that that one's called Pensive Woman, and that was the last painting I did in 1981 with the you know. Uh, background of European people. Okay. Excellent. Before we go forward with the next question, why don't you show us the first couple slides? Because I think they were connected to what you were saying. Well, uh, yeah. Hit, me... hit exit and then remember, because we're, I think you're going oh. through all of them. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, okay. There you go. I wanted to talk about, you know, my influences as, as an artist. Um, my mother and fa father were um, Edmund Spears, Hedge Hay Spears, and Rhoda Amster Victoria Smith Spears. And my mother influenced me as a child because when she would talk on the telephone, we had this green room and it was called the telephone hallway. And she would sit on this table. It was a beautiful table. It was all inlaid with abalone. And I would sit under it and I would watch her while she was on the phone and she would always um, doodle, you know, and she would be doodling pictures of her friends as she talked to them. So I would, you know, peek my head up and I would see these beautiful portraits, mostly profiles. And, uh, you know, she had no idea how talented she was. She never pursued art and she never, you know, mentioned that she could draw pictures like so well, but she did a lot of things um, like she did crafting. She, she made, um, you know, dolls. She, she always made dolls and she also, she sewed a lot. She did a lot of canning and hunting and gardening. So she did a lot of things like very creative things to um, keep herself occupied. So then on my father's side of the family, there was so much talent too. Um, I was influenced by my grandmother, Beatrice Smith um, Spears, who she was Spanish and Indian. And whenever I would ask questions, I was always asking the questions like, well, first when I was like as old as I can remember, a little bit older than a toddler, maybe four or five years old, she used to, um, anytime I asked the question, she would give me a paper and pencil and she would sit me in front of these figurines of Spanish ladies all dressed in their beautiful um, Spanish dresses, you know, with the big puffy um, bottoms, and she'd have me draw them. So that was like the beginning of me being able to um, connect what I was seeing to my hand. So she was a great influence. And then her daughter, uh, my Aunt Doris Spears, um, she also went to RISD. So I, I wouldn't doubt if my grandmother did the same thing with hers, had, had her um, draw everything she saw. That was a good way for my grandmother to make us stop talking. <laughs> you know, the drawing room would keep us occupied for like an hour. And then, you know, my father's brother, Uncle Russell, you know, you're, and uh, he and his sons, you know, your husband, Loren, they have incredible um, aesthetic, stone masonry work and um so the art goes through you know pretty much both sides of my family i feel influenced and then i just wanted to say you know earlier when we said that you know uh that these um collaborations that loren and i have been having go back generations because um eleanor dove who had the dove crest uh loren's grandmother she was really um, close friends and, you know, cousin to my father. And uh, 
and they used to chum around. That's what they called it. So, and you know, the way they explained it, it just seemed like life was fun, love and laughter. That's all they lived on. Even though, you know, there was a lot of hardship in my family. Uh, well, anyways, in that picture, uh, the man on the farthest, I don't know if it's a left or right to you, probably your left, the man with the suit jacket on, um, looking all debonair in his Ferris dove, and the man next to him is my father. I don't know who the other two men are, but that would be them chumming around. And um, Eleanor would tell me stories about how they had a friendship together. But I know my father was in plays at the um, museum really in the way back in the day, you know? So, so then, okay. I don't know what your next question is. Maybe that will. So the next question was more about how does the culture influence your art? And of course, your family is the culture. Yes. So um, as I'll just continue what I was saying, I can answer that question with this. Uh, oh, so the culture, um, you know, influences me because, you know, I wanted to paint people that look like me. So this is how I, I ended up being an author because when I was young and I used to ask those questions, you know, of my grandparents that were very sensitive and of my parents, like, where are the people that looked at, look like me? I, I was born in Warwick, Rhode Island. My parents lived in a few places before then and they had six kids. I was the last of six. So by the time I was born, they had been through a lot of hardships. You know, there was, there was stories that, you know, I wanted to know about because I didn't know anything about my mother's side of the family. Something had happened in her tribe and she never went back after her, her mother died. So I never got to see that side of the family. And I was so curious and I wanted to know, you know, where's mom's people, you know, and why don't we look like anybody in Warwick? Cause there was only like, maybe one or two families of color in Warwick. And so, you know, I felt besides my brothers and sisters, I felt pretty isolated and misunderstood. So, um, so here's a picture of my grandmother on my mother's side, and these are all her grandchildren. And the one way on the bottom, they, that's my sister Dee Dee and my cousin Shirley, they're like 10 years older than me. The rest of them are like 15 and 20 years older than me. So. I didn't really get to grow up with them. So I, you know, I didn't experience the things that they did being around my mother's family. So that's why I was so curious, but little did I know being that curious, I was, you know, unraveling and uncovering, you know, stories that were being hidden because, you know, shame, embarrassment, but there was no reason for it. It was, you know, what the oppressors were doing to our people and, you know, it was the trauma that they lived through um, for generations. So uh, my mom and dad went through a lot of trauma, but, you know, they didn't talk about it. So that's why I just got so curious and I asked so many questions. And, you know, as I got older and older, people would answer the questions. And the more I asked, the more information I got till I got to the point where I realized all the things that my mother and father had told me were the truth, but they were just so sporadic and in puzzles that it was so obscure that I had to take all the stories of, of obscurity and put them together in a linear manner. So, um, so my culture influences me because I want to remedy the misunderstandings and the um, stereotypical um, perspectives that the colonial um, primary documents have made a picture of us as being these people that we are not. You know, they make us, a, they made pictures of us like that we were funny looking, you know, we were evil looking, we were savages. And so I, through my art, I wanted to show this, that this stuff wasn't true, that there was a lot of beauty, there's a lot of beauty in our people. Um, and I want to, you know, by painting pictures of indigenous people from Eastern Woodlands, it shows that we exist, we've always exist, we'll, we're gonna thrive into the future. 
and it puts out a positive note. Um, you know, when you look at my art, it's like some of it may look sad, but underneath it, it's saying we're sad because of, you know, the genocide. But on the other hand, we survived it. So we're resilient people. We're like the, we're like the, uh, you know, the plant that's just not going to go away. We're always going to, we're, our roots are planted here and we're not leaving. So, you know, we may have to ride through a lot of storms, but we'll make it through in the long run. So that is how my culture, um, oh, and I like to bring back the traditions um, that are being lost. Like for one example is my Pugwajis. I think I have a picture of them. My pictures of Pugwajis, uh, where are they go? You know, um, there's, I think there's one book about Pugwajis and it's about how evil they are. And so I wanted to make um, light of how evil they are and show that in any community, there's good and bad. And, you know, there may be good Pugwudgies and there may be bad Pugwudgies, but we have this, um, this part of our tradition too. And it's not, all, it's not evil, which, you know, um, the dominating culture always makes anything that they don't understand about us evil. So I made these, uh, you know, a uh, tribe of little Pugwajis to show that there's some good ones and there's bad ones and there's talented ones and there's, you know, uh, athletic ones. It's like it's a variety so that people can understand that, you know, what has happened to us is still all this, you know, oppression and changing our image to make them justified for all the destruction that they have done to our culture and tradition and our community. Okay, I think I answered that question. Awesome, you did a great job. Um, you. Do you wanna go back to the, the picture of Slow Turtle? Because the next question is about describing your art style and I thought maybe you could go through the several pictures of art that you have and kind of go through and tell us about them. Yes. <clears throat> Well, my uh, style of art is conceptual art. So conceptual means idea. Every um, picture that I start, I start with an idea of um, what I am trying to communicate with the image. So, um, and I'm, I also was trained as an impressionistic artist. That's like the people that like Renoir and Bingo, uh, they, they look at the way that they paint was through ear. Um, a painting isn't flat. It's, if you paint all the colors um, in one color to make that color, then you, it, um, it interconnects with everything that's around it. Um, it's, it's a long study, so it's kind of hard to explain, but, um, it has to do with, you know, the, the nuances of the colors that are outside compared to the colors that are inside. Um, so I'm an impressionist artist, but what I have realized a long time ago is that um, my art is a talent that was gifted to me from the creator and everyone has a gift, they just have to figure out what it is and the sooner they find it out the faster they can get on with their lives uh but i realized that the creator um gave me this gift because there's just certain paintings like this slow turtle painting i saw a picture of slow turtle and then one day i saw this piece of wood and i knew that that piece of wood had slow turtle's face in it i just had to pull it out so um, I pulled out the paints and I think within two hours later, it was complete. And I went into this uh, place that I call flow. Um, flow is where you're so deep into the painting that you don't realize that anything's surrounding you. And um, you're not, I'm not really, conscious of the decisions that I'm making. I'm not thinking consciously of them. They just come instinctively. 
And that's where I feel like, you know, creator takes my hand in my eyes and gives me the, um, you know, answers of what color I need and what line I need to put in and what perspective or what angle or, you know, what texture, how much pressure I should put on something um, to make it look close to reality. I'm not really looking for reality. I'm looking for the energy and the feel and the, uh, it's more than um, two dimensional. It's, it's like almost where you get to this sixth sense where you can feel so much in the person's eyes. You can see the soul, you can feel their energy. So um, that's kind of the process I go through my art. And the reason why I realized that the creator, another reason why I realized that the creator um, gave me this talent and you know sits with me when I'm painting, when I ask, is I had a uh, portrait that somebody asked me to do and it took me, I was working on it for like eight months. I could not get the angles right. I couldn't get the color right. I would draw it and then I would throw it away. And I did this for like eight months. I couldn't get it. And it was really starting to get to me because I was like feeling like to that person, like I can't do this. And how am I going to tell them I can't do this? I just don't have what it needs to get this done. And so one morning I sat in front of the window, the sun was coming in really brilliant, beautiful. And I just prayed and I said, creator, I need this painting done and I can't do it. And next thing I remember is, it, you know, I was done. And it was one of the best drawings I had ever done in my life. <laughs> so, and I went right into that flow, you know, uh, where I subconsciously didn't know what I was doing, but I was, you know, I knew what I was doing, but, but it's a weird place to be where you just so deep into the art that nothing else around you seems like it's around you. So, pick, um, so like Slow Turtle was in that flow. Uh, this one, Two-Hearted two -hearted, um, Wolf. This is where the culture would be effective because you know what I was taught is that I'm a wolf clan from the wolf clan through the Aldican family. And that, you know, um, when there's a, when two become together, it's family. And so the wolf is in there representing family, the bloodline of the wolf clan. So that picture started as somebody asked me to do a Valentine's Day card. And I just ended up in flow and I just let my hand go. And that came out of it. And I had no intention on drawing that, <laughs> just came out. So that one's called Two Hearted Wolf. And this one over to the right is called Good Edgy. And it was the same thing. I looked at a piece of wood and I saw images, you know, throughout the years. And then I thought this image belongs on this piece of wood. And I just painted through it really quickly, like maybe an hour, scraped it down a few times. And then at one point I said, that's it. And that, um, you know, this, this good energy um, image, I've sold a lot of prints and people tell me the same thing every time. Wherever you put it in the house, that's where you have a lot of, if you have company, they all stand in front of it. There's always good conversation there. Um, and it just brings in a different kind of energy, which is very good into a home. So people buy it all the time. And some of my favorite, oh, you're gonna ask me this. All right, I'll go, I'm done with that. You're gonna ask me the next question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead and keep going. Um, my question was about, um, you know, 2020 being a, a, a tumultuous year. So I didn't know if. No, you, you, there's another questions where you said. Um, oh, sharing your favorite pieces and describing their meaning. You were already doing that. So I didn't ask the question. Okay. All right. So, so go ahead and keep going. Pieces, pieces are, um, you know, my family, my husband, my daughters, and my, my son, and any family members, you know, grandparents, in-laws. Um, I love doing pictures of the community together. Um, you know, any... I any, see Silver Moon. Silver Moon. Her mom, people that, you know, they just, you can feel a good, you can feel the light of the world in their presence. So the that's the type of people I like to do 
paintings of. So that's why I did that one. You know, um, this one's at the Tomaquag Museum and all these people are people I love and I wanted to, you know, make sure that they weren't living, the kids weren't living a life that they were being um, influenced by colonial techniques. You know, um, the, the techniques are to not love yourself, to not use your language, uh, not love your community. So I wanted to teach all those techniques so that when they saw those techniques of genocide, in their lives, they would recognize them and say, I'm gonna live the opposite and that's how I know I'll be living a healthy life. So that's how that one came about. That, and my book came about from asking all those questions that I told you earlier. And okay, what was your next so, question? So my next question was, um, what was, um, and this I think ties into this nicely because it was about, um, future goals and projects. So go ahead and tell us about this one that you did last year. Yep, in 2019, this um, mural was about uh, saving the uh, bank of the river from a corporation putting up a, um, what was the good, it was gonna be like a hotel um, stores. And it was on land that, you know, Roger Williams met Massasoit in Canonicus and, and my Tonomi, th this was historical land. It was land where the slaves were um, auctioned off at this place. It was a place where Benjamin um, Church lived. Uh, Roger Williams had his home, his children had their home. It was all on that bank of the river. And I just thought it was ridiculous to put something that commercial on something that was so historically rich. And on top of it, I wanted to the community or the state of Rhode Island to realize that the Providence River is their, you know, is our resource in so many ways. I mean, I spoke about how the water was clean and pristine and where Way Bassett was a place of crossing for all four tribes, um, for, from all four directions of tribes where they would meet and trade. And, you know, and how rich the land and the um, ocean was and the uh, rivers were and, you know, how plentiful they were and how they provided so much for us. And then I went into the 1700s and showed how, you know, industrialization started coming in and what was happening and the slaves being, I, I just showed everything that happened on those banks of the river. And while I was doing that, I was explaining how the uses of the water ended up polluting the water. So we have to look at what we do and determine where, what the effects are gonna be for the next seven generations. So um, it's like a teaching tool to, you know, teach uh, people that don't think about, you know, when they're making money, what resources they're destroying and, and whether or not they will be able to recover them or maybe for them to think about renewable energy where they can make money without destroying anything or making things better and you know the, you know the bottom line is you can't eat money you know that's when people realize you can't eat money then they'll realize that how you know important mother earth is to all of us so that's what that one's about so that's the it's going to be, I'm showing in City Hall in January. There'll be an opening. Excellent. Um, we'll be sure to share that out to the, the, not only the people on this, but all our Tomaquag audience. Oh. Another view. Oh. Okay. Is that another view of the, the mural? Can you hear me? Hear you. Uh, you want another view? Oh. No, I'm saying that is another view, right? Yeah, of the mural? Yes. No? Yeah. I'm in my studio. I have them around me, so if you want to see other views of them. 
Why don't you um, tell us what your future projects that you're working on right now? Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to be working on another mural in um, Wakefield. Uh, what I do is have the community tell me what they want. This community in Cypress Street, they already had this decided. They had somebody else that designed the um, mural and they didn't have anybody that could paint it. So I went in and painted it for them and that was so much fun. Um, so the next one will be another land acknowledgement and I'm waiting for the community and I'm doing research um, to see what their community wants on their mural. So uh, that's in Wakefield. And I'm also working on a series of um, ocean whaling um, paintings. Uh, I have a lot of commissioned work that I can't keep up with. Um, that's why I'm up all night all the time and I'm not functioning very well in the day. I usually work a lot at night because, you know, there's no telephone calls at night. There's nobody coming to the door at night. There's nobody needing a meal. You don't have to get interrupted for, you know, lunchtime. So I do a lot of my work at night. Um, cause I, that's how I can stay really focused or in the daytime when there's nobody around. Uh, what was, um, so then I'm doing another series on my dreams and that's about it. I think, and you know, in the meantime, you know, sewing in between and fixing regalia, making new regalia. Um, uh, the sculpture, I made a sculpture. Um, oh, Bella is one of my, uh, let me get to the sculpture. Uh oh. This sculpture um, I worked on last year, no, this year. This, this sculpture was, um, there was maybe four pieces um, of art that made it through for Providence PVD Fest. Uh, everything was canceled, but this, the sculpture was okay because, you know, you didn't really need people to gather for it and it was still on display. So um, this woman that I'm fishing with on the right, her name's Allison Newsom and she's a very talented artist. And she actually lives on Massasoit Spring site. Imagine that. So um, uh, that has been a, you know, really great connection because she's bringing me to Soams where home is. But um, so she wanted to do this sculpture and she, want, she wanted to do it on a Native American story. So the people at Providence um, PVD Fest said, well, how are you going to do it? A Native American uh, sculpture without the advice of a Native American artist. So that's when she asked me if I would work with her and she said she wanted to do the three sisters. So I said, well, you, how are you going to do it if you don't know the story? So, uh, so she asked me to tell her the story and then I explained to her, the story also comes along with ceremonial traditional ways of doing things, um, you know, with the story. So she was like, what do you mean? So I said, well, part of the three sisters story is that, you know, you plant the corn beans and squash in a certain way. And these are like things that you do seasonally. You know, when the, the you know, the trees will tell you when it's time to go fishing. So you look for the, you know, buds on the trees at, at you know, when they look a certain way. And then uh, you go fishing and, you know, this so I was explaining to her, this is what we did as you know, this is a lifestyle, what I did growing up. In the spring, we went fishing for Tatag. We went fishing on the ocean. We went, then we would go to Gilbert Stewart and we'd get the heron. And we would always like plant it underneath the um, three sisters and make sure the mound was like the size of a nine months pregnant woman. And um, so I took it through, through these, um, uh, uh, experiences that I grew up doing. So we went fishing at the freshwater pond. Then we went to Gilbert Stewart. We went, we couldn't get on the ocean. They wouldn't let us on the ocean because, you know, um, COVID-19. So uh, she took the, so she asked me to do the drawings and I explained all the drawings and I took her around and showed her how we did the planting. And then um, she took my drawings and went to a place in, um, where was it, Malaysia, and had them um, made into metal chains. And then the chains go up on top of the sculpture and the chains 
make the water come down into the uh, chambers, the flowers, and then the flowers bring it, it into the, um, the sculpture and that's where it holds the water. And so that's where if you need, if we're in a drought, then um, you have all that extra water uh, to plant. But she lived in, Allison grew up in the um, forest in uh, like Vancouver. And she says she used to look up into the, um, the, the um, tops of the trees and she would see how the water would um, get caught in the leaves and then eventually come down. So that's like the way that she designs her sculptures. So we're, we're going to be doing new projects. We have other sculptures that we're in the works of doing together. So that's what, and there's, there's an interview um, on NPR of Allison and I in, about, um, regarding putting the sculpture together. So. This that. is a fantastic example of, you know, you reacting to the COVID-19 and other social justice crises, environmental crises that we're going through during 2020 with the fires and the floods and um, the sickness that's happening. That was very powerful, Debbie. But, well, you know, I think when people realize that, um, you know, Mother Earth is angry, just like for 2020, we have the Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is something that has been going on since the beginning of this country, for sure, with slavery. And, you know, beyond before this country, there was always, you know, people that weren't being treated equally and being oppressed. But this year being with the Black Lives Matter came out with George Floyd, it's like, it's the same thing as what the earth is saying. The earth is saying, you know, humans are systematically destroying the earth for money. And, you know, in Black Lives Matter, it's a systematic racism oppression to keep, you know, people that are greedy, to keep them in the, where they're, you know, with all the um, power and money. And so when people aren't being heard, you know, and you do things over and over again and they still aren't being heard, the, at one point there's a fury. And I think that's where um, the earth is at. She has a fever, she's angry, and she is going to make sure she recovers. And we as humans are not, you know, we're in our way at this point. Like we gave the, I mean, I, I, 2020 is the 400th anniversary of Massasoit um, meeting the pilgrims and, you know, having a peace treaty with them the next year and the peace treaty not being honored. And also we taught them how to live, you know, with the connection, with a great partnership and a great understanding of the land of, you know, the idea, of, I hate this word, I can never say it, reciprocity, yeah, there we go, reciprocity, you know, the giving and taking. We taught them that there was giving, there's always got to be given and take for the balance to be correct. And people did, you know, from this system of, of the world, of, you know, of what's happening is, it's just take, 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 and never returning back to the earth what she needs. So she's furious. And, and this picture of Narragansett Bella that shows the stories of trauma, strength, and resilience will hopefully be something that will help people uh, feel the resilience that they need because we're all going through trauma this year in 2020. Um, as I look at the time, we're sort of getting short, so I want to make sure we don't forget to um, let you do one one last thing, and then no, go back to that. Um, and unless that's not what you wanted to share, but I want you to share your your whatever else you'd like to share really quickly, and then I want to be sure to leave a few minutes for questions from the audience. Okay, I just wanted to speak about uh, Netikush. Um, Loren asked me earlier about, you know, how culture affects my art. Well, in my performing arts, you know, a bunch of us women, we met maybe 30 years ago at a memorial um, for the Deer Island Memorial where lots of uh, Native people 
uh, didn't survive through King Philip's war. Um, so we met and we realized that women did sing on the East Coast. We're a matrilineal society and we lost a lot of the music that women were saying. And so we started, you know, just gathering women and learning, seeing what everyone knew about the traditional women's music. And so they taught us and we taught them till we had so much, enough music that we would be performing. And so we still do that. We perform wherever we can. And anyone that wants to learn or teach with us, we have practices like that. So that was a way to recover the culture and tradition of our people. Um, and then. Go ahead and play a little clip because some people might not have heard you before. Just a short clip. This song, my daughter. I sing the south song. I sing the west song. I sing the north song. Way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. So my daughter Jasmine wrote that song. What we what we try to do is bring the next generation so that they can learn. They've learned the traditional way of. Um, Eastern Woodland music for women, and then they can bring it up to a contemporary um, place so that, you know, the next seven generations will be listening to our music and the old and the ancient music too. So, and then I just wanted to say sometimes I go through an a, array of feelings and um, my art is a way that I can get through my feelings so that I don't get depressed. It's expressions. It, it's a way of expression instead of depression. I see that if you don't express yourself, then you get depressed. So this is my way of expressing myself. And these two um, pitches, um, The Eyes Tell All and Stolen Apache, they were about frustration and humiliation at a meeting that I had with, um, you know, uh, it was a museum, not your museum, it was a museum in, um, in Warren that, you know, was on, right next to the Massasoit at Spring Site. And they just were very, um, I don't know, they, they had me pretty aggravated about, you know, they said that I wasn't educated enough to speak about myself. So um, I went home and uh, drew these two pictures because I thought if somebody was that ignorant about me, then I didn't think there was anything that I could say to them that would change their mind. They, their mind was already, um, made up. So I went home and drew these two pictures. And sometimes, you know, I, I have given myself a license a long time ago to paint anything that I want to paint. There's no parameters. I can do whatever I want to do because who, who gives you the licenses <laughs> but yourself? <laughs> Thank so. you, Deb. Can you, um, sh uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll take a few questions here at the end. Yeah. Um, I did have someone in the chat while you're removing your screen that wanted us to remind folks that on November 26th, it's the National Day of Mourning in Plymouth at noontime. Um, there's also a big conference um, that's going on about the 400th uh, anniversary um, remembrance of, 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 of um, this relationship in Plymouth. Um, and uh, hopefully we can post some things out on our social media for you for that. Um, I don't know if we have that handy right now, but um, the conference, um, several people from our area are part of that conference. Dawn Spears, Paula Dove Jennings, myself, um, as well as many Wampanoag relatives and, and folks like that. So if you have a question, um, you can unmute yourself now and feel free to ask that question. I'm not sure if I could keep track. Um, Silver Moon, who's doing our Tomaquag tech, tech, tech might be able to point some questions my way, but um, there's a lot of, um, lot of stuff in the chat, so I don't know if I can see it quickly enough. While they're thinking about that, I just want to say one thing that um, we didn't say, and I saw that Silver Moon put it in the chat, but you can find Debbie Spears Moorhead's artwork at Tomaquag Museum store and our online store. And we also put in the chat her Facebook page and then her direct information that she wanted you to have where you can get her by email or by phone number and buy her original pieces or her prints or her cards. 
um, which are all stunning. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Danny. Hi, Tom. Hi there. How are you, Deborah? Hi. Uh, hey, Naomi, Hi. Has a, Naomi has a question for you. Hey, hi, Naomi. Hi, Deb. I would like to know how you individually or collectively deal with your anger slash rage. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I could deal with it myself. Um, and I'm keenly aware. I don't know why. But every day I wake up in the middle of my woods here, uh, 17 acres and through, what, 900 around us. And I don't think there's a day I've woken up that I haven't been aware that I'm on someone else's land. So uh, as, a, as a retired teacher, I tried a couple times to uh, find a way to teach on reservations or give and, and, um, and because I'm white, I wasn't wanted. And I understand that, but I wanna know how you, uh, maybe with your art, but how do you deal with that anger? I, oh. I couldn't imagine doing, I mean, I'm just flummoxed by it. Well, the thing is, I just never know when I'm gonna be angry. Most of the time I'm pretty level. Uh, you know, I'm pretty level about everything. Uh, I have, what I've done is, you know, researched everything I could possibly do that, uh, that makes me angry and I have an understanding of what happened and I realized that this is just human nature. This has happened in every place in the world that one dominant group dominates another and they use that, you know, colonization techniques and the um, encomiendas use, the Spanish people use that. So I just grab an understanding. Once I understand of it, have an understanding of it, I don't feel as much as a victim because I don't like the role of a victim and I throw that yeah. role off. Exactly. Of right. So I do everything not to be a victim, to be yes. more of a um, person that consciously understands what has happened and realizes okay. it's not, I'm not alone and I'm not a right. victim. So right. that's how okay. I deal with it. And another th way that I deal with it is that for in educational ways that when people think that they can talk about us, I you know, they can tell us about ourselves. I say to them, you know, what would really heal us is that if you want to explain um, something about the native people, let the native people do the explaining. And our story is not just one person. Our story is the whole group. Everyone is equal and that we all should tell our side of the story, you know, so it, so what yeah. I'm saying is being inclusive to mm -hmm. the oppressed people and being inclusive to all who want to contribute so that, because it's everyone's story. It isn't just one group's story. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thanks for the question. Good question. Is there another question in the group? Go ahead, Tom. I have, I have one. It's not a follow-up to Naomi's, but... Uh, you talked about uh, in your early art, you were using European concept. And I was just remembering uh, something uh, about an art course I took a long, long, long time ago. They talked about Michelangelo and how all the only thing he did was release the spirit from the granite. Hmm. He really didn't do anything. So do you in any way believe that you're uh, you know, a conduit or divine transference from uh, wood or canvas of what the creator might be wanting? Uh, that's pretty grandiose uh, of an idea. <laughs> no, I don't know myself. I don't know. But I mean, I want to humbly say that I think that I do have those um, energies that I do. Um, I have six cents. I know a lot of things that, you know, I have no way of knowing. Um, and I do see, I see pictures and everything. I, I mean, any pattern that I see, I, I see um, life in it. And I can pull, you know, that life out of, I can focus right on that one picture and pull it out. I, anywhere I look, I can see a million colors in one color and I can see images of that represent life so i don't know if that's normal for other people I, mm. so i think i think that's and also when i walk the land i you know i have 
all the images that I don't know where they come from and I, I don't know if they're the energy that's left behind, but I can do pictures from that too, which I really don't do a lot of that because it scares me. <laughs> Well, Deb, that was such a great description of the gift, as you said, from the creator of how you get the art out of you and how you get into the flow. Um, I think that's that um, true artist, you know, when you can find that place that is, if you will, um, intervened with the divine, because that is truly the gift. I want our audience to thank Deb again for her fantastic talk today. Um, and sharing with us her, how her life, her culture, her children, her family, and how that all influences her art. Um, I have just a couple of quick announcements I'd like to share with you before you go. Our next session of Quarantine Creatives is scheduled for Friday, October 9th with Candon Robinson at noon. Um, this, con this series will continue throughout the fall. Um, we're scheduled all the way out to December thus far. You can find that on our events page and register. They're all for free. Um, along with our virtual uh, programs that we're offering, we are now taking small uh, private tours here at the museum by appointment. So please feel free to give us a call or check out the website for more information. And I just wanna thank again, our, our funders, uh, the United Way, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, the Rhode Island Council on the Humanities, and of course, people like you that have continued to support and donate um, to Tomaquag Museum and help us through this most difficult time of COVID-19. Um, I wanna thank our staff that's hiding in the background who without them, we would be stumbling all over the technology. Uh, so we wanna say thank you to them. Um, and thank you all so much again for joining us today. And we hope we see you in a few weeks for uh, session three of Tomaquag's Quarantine Creatives. Winnie Kisak. Have a great day and thank you all so much again. Thank you and hi Danny, Richie and, and Catherine. Hello there, Deb, and thank you. Thank you so much. We'll love to talk with you soon. All right. Bye. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, nice to see you, Helen. Nice hi, to Helen. see you, Lauren. Hey. Thanks, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Well, nice seeing you, Maria. <laughs> yep, you too, Lauren. Take care, Deb. Thank you. This is really wonderful. Congratulations, Maria. Hi. <laughs> Hello. How are you? You look great. <laughs> I miss you. Ah, <laughs> uh, I miss you guys too. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Be safe. Congratulations on the twins. Oh, thank you, but I didn't have them. <laughs> I'll keep you posted.